Hello, Jeep peeps. Imagine you're at a car show or just browsing the internet and you find a bargain head for your L134 engine for the World War II Jeep. You pick it up and you have a look at it and you hold it in your hand, but you just can't tell how worn it is. Has someone skimmed the top of it off too much? When you buy this thing, are you going to put it on your Jeep and find that you've got a problem between the contact between the spark plugs and the valves? Really difficult to tell when you're out and about with no calipers to measure the head, but I've discovered a way that you can easily tell how worn it is. So we're going to look at that today. We're also going to decode some of the markings on top of this engine as well, which we didn't know what they meant previously, but fortunately, due to a G503 thread, being able to decode some of that, so that's really cool as well. We'll also have a look at some of the bits on the Jeep I've been working on recently, giving us some updates and improving her a little bit as she reaches 1,000 miles. So let's get started on it. First off, peeps, one of the great things about doing a restoration like this is that it's never completed, okay? Because you can always improve on things. Obviously, this Jeep's built with a lot of reproduction parts or a good number of reproduction parts. But if you leave it unfinished, there's always room for improvement. And that's what I've managed to do here. I've got hold of a really nice new, or should I say, original um, air horn on top of it. And it shows us an interesting thing about these, actually. This is the reproduction which was on here previously. And you can see it has quite a long cutout here where it goes underneath onto this um, tube and underneath this hose. And if you put it on, the uh, hose, which is supposed to clamp them together, doesn't cover this cutout completely, actually. So any sort of dirty air can come inside and go straight down into your engine, okay? And this was an original problem they had in World War II because in Army Motors, there's a letter written in that explains this. And what they were saying is that they um, used to weld up a little bit here to make sure that no air can go in there. And this is what's happened to this original here. Someone's welded it up a little bit. Whereas this repro built from the blueprints has this gap here where the dirty air can get in. Now what the Army Motors manual says to do is to take some friction tape and wrap it round there. Not weld it up like uh, many people did in World War II, but yeah, just use some friction tape and tape it all up there. So just an interesting little thing there that you can see the difference between what you're supposed to do and what people did in World War II. So yeah, nice little addition there with a little bit of historical information. Next up, peeps, is a baffling thing. I just uh, thought you might like to see, I'm sure some of you know about this and are aware of it. We call the thing on here, on the dipstick, a baffle, okay? But no one seems to know exactly what it's for. However, I think it's a clever little Willis uh, design item here. If you've got your dipstick out in the dirt somewhere and you don't really want to put it down, you know where you're going to put it on the side of the Jeep, on the floor, where it's going to get dirty. Well, what they did is they just put a little stand on it so that you can pour your oil in easily without having to lose a dipstick or put it down or get it dirty or anything like that. So rather than it being a baffle, because I can't see it being a baffling, a baffle for anything really, it seems to work much better as a little stand there. So just a little thing I found out there, another nice little design feature on the World War II Jeep. They knew what they were doing. I've improved my World War II hull compasses as well. You can see I've changed over to one with uh, 10 decimal marks on it rather than this one here, which I had on it previously, which just has north, south, east and west. Look, they're, they're affecting each other. I think this one's probably more suitable for use in a war wartime Jeep, whereas this one's possibly more suitable for use in a sort of civilian market or something like that. I'm surprised, I must admit, that they didn't put radium markings on these uh, compass points as well, actually, because if it's on a military vehicle and you're using it at night in blackout and things like that, it's not illuminated in any way. So to have radium markings like you have on the um, speedometer and things like that, you'd have thought they would have done that, but apparently they didn't. But uh, this is just a nice little improvement here, talking about improvements on the Jeep there, swapping over to that uh, 10 degree marked um, hull compass. Very nice. Okay, peeps, let's talk heads then. So you're out at your swap meet or something like that, or you're browsing heads online and you see one, you want to buy it, you want to fit it to your Jeep, you want to swap it over for an original World War II one or something like that, let's say, okay. You got the pictures from the seller and it all looks beautiful. It's all shiny and clean and everything like that. But how much has the guy taken off beforehand? Is the head still usable? Now, these heads, what we're talking about is when you've got your spark plug in here, the two valves ride here, okay? And uh, if you take off too much meat, off the head, 
the spark plug will move down towards the head and towards the valves, and you could have a problem where the spark plug hits the top of the valves, okay? It doesn't seem to be a big problem with L134 engines. I mean, I don't think it is a massive problem, but it's just an interesting thing we can uh, look at here to work out actually how thick, uh, how much thickness is left on this head uh, for machining, okay? If you're gonna buy one, okay, without having calipers around. So the actual thickness of it, measured from here, to the face should be two inch and nine sixty fourth. Okay, great. Well, that's fine. But when you're out and about, you're not able to work that out easily. So fortunately for us, we do have a bit of a wear indicator on here. Okay, so you can see around the combustion chamber here, the pistons run here. We've got this cutout here to allow the gas flow to go up where the valves are, so that the, the gas can flow easily in and out of the valves. Um, so they put a little relief in there, and hopefully, if you can just see, can you see? There's a gentle relief, a gentle cutout along here, okay? And you can see it on each one of them. Now, the great thing about this relief is, is because it's angled, as someone machines away meat off the head, this um, relief will get less and less and less. So what you're able to do is when you're looking at pictures or when you pick one up, if you can see, this one has never been touched, it's quite easy to see. But as they get machined more and more, this relief will disappear and disappear until it becomes, finally, when it's been, you know, taken quite a lot of uh, meat off it, it becomes a sharp edge like these sharp edges here. So it goes from looking like this here at this side, you can see the relief, to looking like a sharp edge again. And when it looks like a sharp edge, you know that it's been machined quite a lot already. You're going to have to be very careful when it comes to measuring the spark plug and the uh, valve interference to make sure that they don't clash or something like that, okay? But you can just have a look from this one here. It goes anything from looking like this to being completely sharp, okay? And that's how you can tell very easily with this little wear indicator, which isn't really a wear indicator, it's just something we can use to look at the wear. Um, you can tell very easily without having to measure it or anything like that. So this is just a cool little tip there, a very useful little tip to see how much life is left in a head and whether you're gonna to have to start doing some measuring to make sure that your spark plugs don't come in contact with a valve. So just a little nice little tip for you there. The block has also sort of got a wear indicator on it as well, which is really useful for us to tell whether the block has been faced at all as well. Obviously, if it's been faced too much, you can start to have problems with how high the pistons travel. You know, they may come into contact with the head and things like that. Also, valve spring tensions will be incorrect if too much meat is taken off the top of the block. So there's some things there that you want to find out whether this has been faced or not, okay? And what the, we can use to tell whether it's been faced or not are these original markings here. We can see B, 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 B. Lots, lots of engines won't have these markings up here. These are the British Army markings put on later, but we do have these markings around the cylinders and beneath the valves. Now, the question is that I've just found out recently, thanks to G503, is what do these actually mean? I thought they were just inspection stamps. So I thought when the inspector came round, he measured them all out and he went, yeah, that's fine, B, 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 that's my inspection mark or whatever, okay. Well, it sort of is like that in a way, but it's something even cooler than that. This little mark here, you get A, B, C, D, right? And when this uh, block was machined, the inspector came around and he measured these bores to within half a thousandth of an inch. The nominal diameter of these bores should be 3.1250 inches, okay? But when he measured them, he may have found it, say it was 3.1260 or something like that, just, um, just a couple of thousandths or half thousandths of an inch is out of the uh, nominal size. So what he did then, if it was between 3.1250 and 3.1255, he would put an A on there. And if it was between 3.1255 and 3.1260 inch, he would put a B on there and so forth down to C and D as well. So what this means is that these bores here could then be matched with an exact piston. So you get A, B, C, D pistons as well from the factory. So this engine then is a B, which means it's 3.1255 to 3.1260. It would be matched with a B piston at assembly. They would look and they would see the Bs and they would match it with a B piston. So it would be accurate, the bore and the fit would be accurate to within half a thousandth of an inch, which is really, really impressive if you think about it. Um, has anyone ever seen one of the pistons, a standard size pistons with an A, B, C, D on it? I would be really interested to know. I found my uh, GPW block also had these marks on it as well, so it looks like Ford and Willis were both doing this. But now we know, thanks to someone on G503, what these uh, markings mean on there. Pretty cool, eh? Well, I thought that was pretty interesting information. So next time someone mentions old Jeep tractor engines to you, you can remind them that they were matched with the bore and the pistons to half a thousandth of an inch. Let's see what that looks like.